look at evolutionary game theory, which is the mathematical foundations of, of Darwin's idea, that, that mathematics tells you very, very clearly that the, the payoff functions that govern the evolution of a system, including its, its um, perceptual systems, its sensory system, the payoff functions almost surely do not have information about the structure of the world. And almost surely is a technical term. It means essentially with probability one. With probability one, they don't have information about the structure of the world, so they couldn't shape an organism to have you know, sensory systems that tell them about the structure of the world. Hmm. Now, I've had a couple of responses from colleagues in, in my field and, and, and philosophers on this. Um, from philosophers, it's well, Hoffman, you shot yourself in the foot, logically. I mean, Darwin's theory assumes that there are real physical objects like tables and chairs and organisms and resources in space and time. And so if, if the mathematics of evolutionary game theory uh, says that that's not the case, if that space and time and physical objects are not fundamental, mm. uh, there's there's two horns of this dilemma. Either the mathematics of evolutionary game theory faithfully represents Darwin's ideas, or it doesn't. If it doesn't, of course you shouldn't use it to do to do this. And if it does, it couldn't possibly refute Darwin's basic fundamental ideas. Yeah. So either way, Hoffman, you're in an unfortunate dialectical situation. Mm. Uh, you, in other words, you shot yourself in the foot, and and you should probably take some philosophy before you start doing science like this. Bad. This is it's and, Talus, isn't it? Talus um, had these Talus and objections, uh, yeah, and Bagwell. They're um, saying, "Hang on, you're doing your reasoning within the space-time framework, so therefore you can't disprove the existence of space-time." But the, do you want to explain? Do you want to do you want to explain to us why why that's foundationally wrong? <laughs> Well, we, well, yes, and, and that was sort of why I, I started off by yeah, talking about yeah. theories having assumptions and mm. and and then their conclusions, and and that a great theory gives you the tools to show the limits of that theory. So yeah. all I'm doing is is doing as essentially what people do with Einstein's theory, right? They they use the mathematics of Einstein's theory to point out, well, it start it falls apart at ten to the minus yeah. thirty three centimeters. Yeah. No surprise, every scientific theory has its limits. Period. Mm. And the, the the brilliant one of the brilliant things about science is most of our informal theories, of course, they're going to have their limits, but they're so informal you can't figure out what the limits are. <laughs> and so you can talk BS where you don't even know you're yeah. talking BS. Yeah. Whereas with the scientific, a good scientific theory, it gives you the tools without shooting yourself in the foot logically yeah. to find the limits of the very concepts that are the foundation of the theory. And mm. so so. So yeah, the argument is is now I, I'm not saying that it's not possible to refute yourself. Sure, it's, but but it's not necessary that you are refuting yourself when mm. you take theory and and use its its own mathematics to show the limits of those concepts. And it you know and Gödel was not refuting himself when he used axioms of arithmetic to show the 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 incompleteness of those very axioms. He did that without self, and that's all. I'm basically the same kind of idea, but in a different framework. Mathematical theories in science surely have the power of arithmetic, and so they they're subject to Gödel's incompleteness. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And, and so, the, yeah, provably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pro provably. So, yeah. so, so that's why I'm not shooting myself. Well, uh, why I'm not necessarily shooting. Yeah, you can still go back and look at my logic. And say, well, yeah, even though it's not necessary that you shoot yeah. yourself, you, you did shoot yourself. Into it. So people can do that, but but the a priori arguments don't hold. Can I can I just check something there with you, Don? Because for me, it doesn't seem as though you're denying that there's something there that can be described with evolutionary theory. There is some phenomena there, but you're just saying it is not standalone, extensible, you know, physical stuff in space time, right? So it's probably it's probably the results of some other form of mentation or some other conscious agency that we're rubbing up against. So so that brings me to an interesting kind of question, actually, because you've often um, talked about this idea of you know when you're not looking at the moon, it's not there. But can I, can I just refine that a little bit? Can I ask whether, presumably you think there is something there that looks like the moon that continues on when we're not looking at it, or are you going even further than that and saying that there is literally nothing there at all when it's not being perceived? Yeah, I think well, there's something there and uh, the relationship to my ex experience of the moon is completely arbitrary. It's, so for example, to give you an idea, just a metaphor for how I'm thinking about it, if, if you're playing 
a virtual reality game like Grand Theft Auto with a VR headset on and so forth. And, and you look over and you see a red Ferrari and you're racing a red Ferrari. Yeah. Well, in this metaphor, the reality is some supercomputer. And what you're really doing is toggling voltages at millions of voltages per second or billions per second in some supercomputer. If you looked inside that quote unquote reality, you wouldn't see a red Ferrari anywhere. Mm. So, so the red Ferrari, of course, is related to those voltages and their toggling rates inside the supercomputer. But, mm. but there's nothing red and there's no Ferrari, there's no steering wheel, nothing like that in the computer. That's how different our perception of the moon is from mm. whatever the reality is that uh, is, is triggering us to have that mm. experience. And that so reminds us just briefly don sorry that reminds me of something else really interesting you said that actually it might be the case when we're looking at phenomena that you know doesn't do it like looking at a stone right um it might be the case that there's more going on there but we just it because it's irrelevant to us for survival purposes we haven't honed in on it you know there, there was no payoff function involved in actually understanding what phenomena is really going on there so that you know it could be that there is something a hell of a lot more interesting than a, than a pebble on the beach you know um but uh, we we can't know can we I, 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 that's right that that is a good argument from ep evolution notice what we're doing there though we're, we're saying for sake of argument let's let's assume for sake of argument that we're going to take evolution as our framework and those assumptions we mm -hmm. know that we already know that if space-time is doomed there's going to be a deeper sense in which evolutionary theory is doomed mm -hmm. but but what you have to do as a scientist is say let's assume this framework and see what it says and then i agree with you in that framework of evolution the argument would be evolution on its own terms would say there are selection pressures for us to not know what we don't need to know to stay alive. And I don't need to know the atomic structure of a, of a stone or of the carrot that I'm eating to, mm. to eat the carrot and successfully get the nutrition. So yeah. uh, since there are no, that will not increase my fitness, then mm. uh, that, now, now I should say, you know, so I'm not about debunking scientific theories. I'm not trying to debunk mm. evolutionary mm. theory. Let me put it on the table. I think Darwin's theory is incredible. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful theory. And inside space time, there is, I have seen no theory that comes close to the power of Darwin's idea so and to, the power of yeah. Yeah. It, to explain mm -hmm. human behavior and, and human perception and, and the perception. And, so it's, it's, if you are trying to understand biology in space time terms, then I would say, Go with Darwin. There's nothing that competes. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying, if your attitude is, oh, Darwin is the final word, I would say no theory is the final word. There's nothing special about Darwin. Mm -hmm. I'm not tuning Darwin. There is no scientific theory. That's the theory of everything. Yeah. And if you think otherwise, you will look quaint in a century. Mm -hmm. Science will have moved on and yeah. your addiction to a particular theory will just look quaint. There's a certain irony here, isn't there, Don? Because it seems like the most successful and productive scientific theories are the ones that we end up dragging along like a ball and chain for even, you know, I mean, you, you sort of, you know, materialist me mechanistic physics gave us steam locomotives, planes, trains and automobiles. So, oh, it must be true. You know, so, you know, the kind of the, the model that supports these industrial endeavors and so on and so forth must be a real model. And, and so there's the temptation, is it? And that's, you know, that's some reason for people clinging on to these, these old kind of, these, these old models. And, but yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But yeah, I, I would agree. And I would, I would say that, that, <clears throat> that, that seems to be a pattern that we all, that we think that we now have, we're close to the theory of everything where, you know, we either have it or we're, we're that close mm. to it. And, yeah. and I think that, it, that this is not merely a scientific foible. I think it's it's something about the human mind that we mistake concepts for the reality. Mm. Concepts are just concepts. They're pointers to the reality. But the reality, not only does reality transcend any of our scientific theories, reality transcends any kinds of concepts or words that we might want to use. Again, I'm not saying I'm against words and concepts. I use them all the time. You just have to have you know prudent understanding of the limits of what you're doing. Mm. Um, including when you put concepts on yourself and others, right? Yeah. You know, when, when we actually label ourselves or label others, instead of just being with ourselves and being with others, we're missing the reality that, that's hiding behind our concepts. So, so this thing about mm. being tied to our theories and, think, and, and not being able to let go of them is very, very personal because we have theories about who we are and we, mm. we can't let go of those. And so 
this is not just about science. It's about actually personal understanding and development. Crikey, yeah. So it's kind of like it's about sort of looking in, isn't it? Um, it's it sort of turned the you know, obviously the the obsession with space time because it's been such a successful paradigm frame of reference. Um, you know, we, we're looking out there, looking for the the answers inside this kind of space time manifold. But um, obviously, you're kind of sort of turning it on its head and sort of looking within and saying, well, actually, what is going on with consciousness? Really?